Good morning and welcome. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together again and to be able to come together and, and worship and praise the name of our Lord. It's called to worship this morning. I'll be reading from Psalm 150. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us bow as we begin our service this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together this day to praise your name. Thank you that we can draw together as the people of God and know that you are in our midst as we worship you. May our hearts bow before you. May our hearts be open to hear from you, from your word this day. May you challenge us, inspire us, strengthen us, and encourage us each and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Very happy to have you all here again today. Um, I guess you can all stay seated. But we will, um, uh, you can stand, I guess, if you want to. But And um, we will, again, do music together. <laughs> Come people of the risen King who delight to bring him praise. Come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace. From the shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to him. Where steady arms of mercy reach to gather children in. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice, one heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, rejoice. Come those whose joy is morning sun and those weeping through the night, come those who tell of battles won and those struggling in the fight for his perfect love will never change and his mercies never cease but follow us through all our days with the certain hope of peace rejoice rejoice let every tongue rejoice one heart one voice oh church of Christ rejoice. Come young and old from every land, men and women of the faith. Come those with full or empty hands, find the riches of his grace. Over all the world his people sing, shore to shore we hear them call. The truth that cries through every age, our God is all in all. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. Church of Christ, rejoice. Oh, Church of Christ, rejoice. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, 
Lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus give. Lift up your heart, lift up Don for leading in our opening songs. Does anybody else feel that awkward tension where you start singing and you realize you're not really supposed to? Yeah. Joy gave me an elbow. She was like, no, you're not supposed to do that. Oh, right. Forgot. Uh, a few announcements uh, this morning. Uh, tonight we have uh, one of our summer fireside nights out at Ed and Edna Lowen's. Uh, so bring your own chair, drink, marshmallow, or snack, um, and we will be maintaining appropriate physical distancing but a chance to be together, to visit, and, uh, and share some time together. So if you can make that, that's at 6.45 at Edin, Edna Lowens. Uh, the directions were in the email bulletin. If you didn't get a copy of that but need instructions how to get there, don't ask me. I don't really know. I'll be following the directions as printed in the bulletin that I have. Uh, speaking of which, um, if you do uh, want a copy of the bulletin but you don't get our email, or if you get our email but don't have a printer and would like a printed copy, we will be putting printed copies in mailboxes for those who want them. So let Lisa or I in the office know and we will be slotting them in there. You can pick them up then Sunday morning when you come into church rather than passing them out to, um, um, to avoid the handling of bulletins. So uh, if you'd like a bulletin, let us know. We'll put one in there. And uh, if you do need directions, um, I'm sure Rachel can uh, provide directions or somebody else knows how to get there specifically. Uh, for five-day club starts tomorrow uh, and so there's room to register if you haven't registered if you know somebody aged 5 to 12 who'd be interested in coming out and spending uh, that time with us uh, from 10 to 11 30 uh, we have some people coming from CEF who are going to lead the programming um, so that's every day this week uh, still can register and even if kids can't make it every day of the week even if they can come for just a few that is perfectly all right as well and then uh, the other note in the bulletin was uh, the benevolent offering for August uh, coming up next month starting next Sunday will be for the Crisis Pregnancy Center here in the Westman area. Any other announcements this morning? Nobody has anything to share? All right, then uh, let us pray. Uh, as we have been doing, uh, our offering plate is at the back on the table, and we invite you to leave your offering either at the beginning or the end of the service. I will now pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for uh, your love for us. Uh, we pray now, Lord, for our tithes and offerings, that as we give back, it would be for your purposes and your glory that we give, that it would help to build the kingdom, your kingdom, Lord, the kingdom established in the name of Jesus. And we pray that it would go forth and the gospel message would spread by the work that we do here as a congregation. In your name we pray. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. 
me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield. Though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me. Yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I guess I won't call the kids up again, but um, if you want to, this song does have action, so like, you know, feel free to do them if you want to. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know. He is the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by we're moving forward, little by little, taking ground. Every prayer, a powerful weapon, strongholds come tumbling down and down and down and down. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high.
Can you hear me okay on this? Oh, good. All right. Well, I have a question for the kids, all right? And I wrote down my questions so I didn't forget them. And I want you to be really, really honest because I know you will be. I want you to put your hand up if you are perfect. Nobody put their hand up. That is very honest. So I'm taking it that nobody here is perfect and all of you have been in trouble before. You got in trouble with your mom and dad or did something you shouldn't have done and kind of got in trouble. If you've gotten in trouble before, put your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan, I'm glad you got your hand up. That's good. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? It's not fair just to pick on the kids, is it? Let's ask the adults. Okay, adults, how many of you here have ever been in trouble before and done something wrong? Put your hand up. Oh, everybody. See, i got to put my hand up, too. I've been in trouble a lot. Well, how many of you have been put in a time out for being in trouble? Yeah. You had to go maybe sit on a chair somewhere. And, and why do you, you know why your parents maybe made you do that? When I was young, we didn't have a timeout chair, but they sent us to our room. And so we, we would have time to think. That's what your parents want you to do, right? They want you to think about what you just did or think about how sorry you are. And maybe you don't feel sorry, and that's why they want you to go think about it. So maybe you'll feel sorry and want to apologize, right? Well, for those of you that were here last week, Pastor Andrew has started a really cool series on Jonah. And I don't know if you guys have had the opportunity to read about Jonah yet, but Jonah disobeyed God and got into some trouble. And God had to put Jonah in a time out. <laughs> but guess where Jonah had his time out? Inside a big fish for three whole days and three nights. And what do you think Jonah did? I mean, that cannot be... I would take a timeout chair any time, right? So what do you think Jonah did in there? Well, he didn't just do nothing. He had time to think, right? What else are you going to do in there? But Jonah also prayed to God, and he thanked God for caring for him and thanked God for the things that he did um, for Jonah. And Jonah, when he was in the belly of the fish, realized that he was sorry, and, and he repented. He, he changed his mind and decided that it was time to obey God. So I don't think anybody here is going to have to worry about having a time out in a big fish. Although, if your parents start building a big pond in your backyard, you might want to get a little concerned. But no, you're not going to be winding up inside a fish for a time out. But when you do get put into a time out, remember to spend that time praying to God to help him, to ask him to help you to, um, to do better and to obey your parents and to learn from what your parents are trying to teach you. And let's have a quick prayer, and then we'll get on with the rest. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you love us enough to uh, correct us when we do things that are wrong. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us parents to help guide us so that we can become the best followers of you ever. Please be with us this week and help us to, if we get into trouble, remember to use that time out to pray to you and to help us become uh, to do better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we go to our time of congregational prayer, are there any prayer requests this morning that we can be praying for? We'll be praying for uh, the Brown family and the passing of Lloyd uh, this week. Um, the service will be this week, and we'll send out an email with some information about that uh, once we have the details confirmed. But we'll pr be praying for Sharon and, and family, for Shannon and, and Tanya in, in the passing of Lloyd. Any other prayer requests this morning that we can, we can be praying for? Stacy? Anyone else? Christina, okay. Anyone 
else? Okay, then I invite you now to, to bow with me as we go to a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege it is to gather together. The privilege that we can come together and worship you. To glorify you, to look upon your name and know that you not only are listening, but you hear and you care about the desires of our heart, Lord. That we can set aside this time to be together in the body of Christ and to, to lift up our voice together to you. Lord, we come before you with many requests upon our heart, Lord. Things unsaid or unspoken, the desires, the hurts, the pains, the sufferings that we're experiencing, Lord. This week we lift up to you the Brown family for Sharon, for Tanya and Shannon and, and the family and the passing of, of Lloyd, Lord. We ask that you would be with them and bring them comfort and peace. That in their grieving you would be there in the midst to guide them, to strengthen them, to walk with them and saying goodbye to a loved one. Lord, we are thankful that Lloyd knew you and that he is experiencing the fullness of faith as he sits before you now in eternity. But Lord, for those left here, they still experience the heartache of missing a loved one, and so we ask that you'd be with them in this time. Lord, we lift up Stacy to you and some of the challenges she's experiencing this week with her medications. We just pray, Lord, that you would give her body the peace that it needs, that you would allow things to function as they should, and that you would continue to walk and to guide her and her family, Lord, each and every day. We lift up Christina and the, the health challenges she's had this week, and um, having to go into the hospital and, and experience treatment, Lord. We just pray that the, the treatment would be working to restore her, Lord, to give her strength, Heavenly Father. We pray as this has been an especially difficult time on those in care homes, in, in facilities where a access to uh, friends and family has been restricted, that you would just continue to encourage Christina and others who are in that place, Lord, of experiencing the, uh, the not seeing their friends and family in the way they would like, Lord. And so would you just give her strength this day, Heavenly Father. Lord, we lift up our world and the, the challenges that COVID presents, Lord. And as Linda shared, it's especially affecting places like Bolivia, Lord. We think of Tim and Callie who are there serving, but the, the many who are there serving your name and are experiencing extreme challenges of, of, of caring for the poor and the impoverished, of those who are hurting. And Lord, we just pray that your spirit would sweep through that land, that you would provide the resources, the treatment, the medical supplies that are needed to battle through this difficult time. And Lord, we pray that we would be strengthened as a result. And Lord, now as we continue in our time of worship, as we look into your word, we pray that it would come alive to us, that it would transform our hearts, that it would give us the determination and the strength that we need, Lord, to face each and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. This time I'm going to invite Tiana Reimer up. Tiana is our summer intern who started this week. And so she'll be reading scripture for us this morning. Uh, Tiana has spent the last couple years at Torchbearer School in Comfort, Texas, called His Hill. It's a, a Bible school, and uh, she's back now in, in Brandon, and uh, is going to be with us for about 12 weeks. Um, and uh, we look forward to having her here. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? I'm good? Okay. Um, so we're reading from Jonah chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, Yet I, shall look again, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountain. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. 
and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Um, I can pray, and then we can move forward. Um, Lord, I thank you so much for just who you are, and that we can um, gather together even during um, the weird circumstances and um, pandemic. And um, Lord, I thank you just for your word. May it um, speak to us and our hearts be open um, for what you have for us today. In your name, amen. So if you measured uh, two points on the earth to try to find out what are the two furthest points from each other, um, you'd have to measure probably very really close to the equator. But if you measured those two distances, you'd probably, probably come somewhere roughly close to about 20,000 kilometers apart uh, for our American friends, about 12,500 miles. It's a pretty far distance to go um, to, to get to say physically being the furthest away from another point you could actually be. Uh, it, the largest distance between two cities, uh, though they ca classify a city as 100,000 people, would be Rosero, Argentina and Jinghao, China, which are close to 20,000 kilometers apart. So those two cities, if you live in, live in either of those cities, you'd be um, at the furthest part from anybody else um, if they lived in, in that part of China. Now, Distance may not always seem that far. Sometimes distance can seem extremely far. And uh, I know that during the pandemic, the distance that doesn't always necessarily feel the same way feels a little bit longer because you can't travel across certain distances. For a while here in Manitoba, if we left the province, we had to hide out for 14 days upon getting back. Uh, for some family and friends that we have that we were planning to see, the distance feels even much further knowing that we can't travel it than when we can. Why am I talking about distance? Well, Jonah in his running was hoping to put as much distance between himself and God. I don't think he was imagining that he could get 20,000 kilometers away from God, but he was at least trying to make distance and think how far away from God could he get so that he didn't have to think or remember. As we looked last week, it wasn't that he thought that he could make that distance and God would no longer see him, Rather, it was this hope that if he went somewhere where maybe God w wasn't known, he wouldn't have to be reminded of his decision he had made. He had tried to put a physical gap where one could not happen. His goal of running was interrupted by a storm. God sends and redirects his path, and as Angela brought up, used a fish to do it. Now, um, I don't know about you, but when I was ever sent to my room as a kid, the last thing I usually thought about was why I was there. There'd usually be like a million other things in the room that I'd think about. I'd be like, oh, look, there's that speck of dust up there. Or, hey, maybe I could rearrange that. Or, like, I don't know about you, but I would get distracted. Um, sorry to mom and dad if you're watching. Um, as ch chapter 2 uh, begins, Jonah uh, is found himself within the belly of a fish. Um, if you watch the VeggieTales version, they call it a whale. Uh, we aren't certain what species of fish it was, uh, but it was definitely large enough to consume um, Jonah as a snack. Um, and so Jonah finds himself. And the whole prayer must be remembered that it is while he is still in danger, while he is ex still experiencing the uncertainty of what is going to happen. It is in that place that he experiences God's presence God's loving care upon him. It is not as if Jonah, once he went back, is now reading back into it. Scholars believe that this is what Jonah experienced and then articulated in his words. And so it begins chapter 2 with Jonah calling out. It says, Then Jonah prayed 
to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. Jonah, in the midst of the storm, prior to this fish's arrival, is in the midst of the storm in the sea. The waves are crashing over his head. It is a picture of desperation, a picture of uncertainty, of of not knowing what to do. And it is only at this time, it is only at this time that when Jonah is now in the midst of this great storm and struggle, that he decides to call upon the Lord's name. If you go back to chapter 1, after getting the call to arise and go, he arose and fled. Then throughout the the chapter 1, there were opportunities where Jonah could have turned and prayed to the Lord, could have turned and sought the Lord's forgiveness. In fact, he was even instructed to do it by pagan sailors. Call upon your God, and yet Jonah does not. He refuses to call upon the Lord's name. It is only now, once he has endured the storms of the water, only now, when the waves have crashed over him, when he feels like the end is near, does Jonah call upon the Lord. We might go, oh, why did he wait so long? Well, let me ask you, how often do you wait to call upon the Lord? How often is it our first response to go to God, or is our first response to try to figure it out ourselves? We naturally as people, typically try to think that, hey, I can find a solution if I just work hard enough, or if I just think about it enough, or I just do it myself. We wait until typically we are at the end of our means that we go, oh, you know what? I need a dramatic intervention. It seems to be a human condition to wait as long as possible. And I don't think it's simply a case of Jonah's procrastination. Um, I believe um, the procrastinator support group is starting up soon soon maybe tomorrow maybe the next day we'll see um but it's not a simple case of procrastination it's not that he was like oh you know what i'll just get to it later i'll get to it later i'll get to it later it was simply him ignoring god partly because he may have felt like god would probably not want anything to do with him he's turned his back on him maybe the distance he has tried to put physically has translated into a spiritual disconnect from God that cannot be overcome. Maybe he feels like there is nothing that God would want to do with this failed person. The opening words summarize his state. Out of his distress, God answered him. Out of the belly of Sheol, you heard my voice. The use of the word Sheol represents the deep depths, the understanding in the Hebrew of the the grave, the point at which death has arrived, which Jonah feels that that is his case. In his near-death experience, he feels like this is the end, a sense of hopelessness, even in that place of darkness, even in that place of, of no hope for Jonah, he cries out, and God is there to answer him. That ought to bring us encouragement in our journey, that there is no distance too far where God can't reach you. Paul writes to the church in Rome to remind them of this in Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. He says, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That even if you travel to the furthest point from here on earth, God is still present and able to hear from us. He is able to respond if we call upon his name. Jonah experienced that in a very powerful and dramatic way. I hope it takes none of us being swallowed by a fish in the depths of the sea to awaken to what God might have for us. Hopefully we can figure that out a little bit sooner than that. Hopefully we are not so out of tune with what God is doing that we are drifting away. But Jonah still has to experience the storm. It is not that God redeems him prior to the storm. He still has this experience in the storm, which he recounts in verses 3 to 6. For you cast me, kind of blaming God for where he is, you cast me into the deep, into the hearts of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven from your sight, Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. 
Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountain, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me up from the pit, O Lord my God. Jonah powerfully describes the experience he went through with quite detail of what he was experiencing, the things that were happening around him that he was out of control of reminded me as I, I, I saw this. Um, does anybody remember the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie? Wasn't very well liked, I don't think. Anyways, there's a scene in where, where there's this massive battle going on and there's all sorts of things happening on the ship and the water is, is going around and they're kind of being sucked into uh, the water and there's water just happening everywhere and there's just so much chaos happening. I saw that movie in theaters, and, and usually when I go to a theater, I try to sit higher up, but we got there late, and so we we're sitting lower down, and it, it almost made me feel a little bit nauseous in there as these water is, is moving around, and everything is happening that you almost feel like it's on top of you. How much more present and real would that have been for Jonah as he's actually in the water? The water is crashing around him. There he is struggling. He is struggling. He paints a pi vivid picture of a bleak situation. And yet, even in the midst of that struggle and in the midst of the storm, he is able to recognize that the Lord is present with him. Verse 4 almost sounds a little bit like a, 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 quest, a declaration that actually probably should be more of a, a question. He says, I am driven from your sight, talking about his, his behavior towards God, his sinful nature that has now removed him from from where he was upon the ship in safety. And then it says, yet I shall again look upon your temple. The ESV um, and most English translations seem to have more of a, a statement oriented to it, like almost like he's saying, hey, I'm going to look on your temple again. But th the root underneath it more gives it a sense of, shall I look towards your temple? As in, a, is it possible that I could still see the temple of the Lord? Now, why would Jonah talk about the temple at this point? Well, Israel, it was the, the place where they believed the presence of God dwelt most strongly. It was the place where they believed that the presence of God was most fully experienced, and that was his desire to once again experience the fullness of God's presence. Even in the midst of this storm, as the waves are crashing over him, he desires to see what God has for him. Jonah had hope. We see in Daniel, when he prayed, he would pr pray um, from Babylon. He would face towards the temple in Jerusalem. Not that that was the only place he would experience God's presence, but it was a humble disposition towards God to look towards where they believe God to be. Jonah is d drifting. The end is closing in, and yet he hopes. He longs to see God's presence again. It can be hard to, to do that in the midst of the storm can't it? To think about the goodness of what God might have for us when the waves are coming over our heads, when we're experiencing the heartache and the hardship of life. Maybe you've even experienced that in the last few months. As it seems like there's a bleakness. I was talking to my mom and I said, you know, I think we'd have an easier time with the pandemic if we knew an end date. If we knew, hey, this will wrap up and be done with at this point. Because then we could look forward to it and go, oh, hey, I know that everything's going to be resolved at this point in time. But we don't really have that, do we? There's kind of this wondering of when will things get back to some sense of, of normal? When will things be the way we hope them to be, want them to be? This week I was reading a book by N.T. Wright called God and the Pandemic. It's his kind of reflections and thoughts as the, the pandemic started and was published uh, just a couple weeks ago. He says that for the church, he believes the correct response in the midst of the pandemic is lament. That we ought to lament that things aren't the way that we desire them to be. He notes that one third of the Psalms are lamenting that things aren't what we desire them to be. Jesus himself quotes from psalms that are both lament and praise of God. To lament that things aren't necessarily as comfortable or agreeable or the things that make us comfortable, we should lament. Lament to seek out and to pray to God for his intervention. To pray to God that he would bring good out of this difficult situation. 
to bring hope in the midst of chaos, to bring peace in the midst of the storm. He writes, in an acute time of crisis, when death sneaks into houses and shops, when you may feel healthy yourself, but you may be carrying around the virus without knowing it, when e every stranger on the street is a threat, when we go around in masks, when churches are shut and people are dying with nobody to pray besides their bed, this is a time for lament, for admitting that we don't have easy answers, for refusing to use the crisis as a loudspeaker for what we've been wanting to say in any case. It's for weeping at the tomb of our friends, for the inarticulate groaning of the spirit. But as Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Yes, the world is weeping right now. The initial calling of the church, first and foremost, is to take our place humbly among the mourners. That in the midst of the storm, it is okay to be upset. It is okay to lament, to pour out our frustrations towards God, not at God. There's a difference. To pour out our frustrations and to mourn with those who are suffering, to stand alongside those who are experiencing the hardship. The truth that Jonah experiences in the middle of the hardship is that God was present with him in it. The truth for us today that even in the midst of the struggles, even in the midst of the lamenting, even in the midst of the frustration of our present time, God is still with us and active in this world. God has not forgotten us. God has not bailed on the situation. God is still there working. And he calls us to work alongside by walking with those he's placed around us. For Jonah, he, in the midst of this, then turns from recapping his situation to an anticipation, a declaration of what is to come. Jonah's tone is redefined in the passage as he what? Remembers the Lord. See, as he turns his eyes towards God, he remembers what God is capable of. It fundamentally changes the situation he's experiencing. Again, Jonah writes these words while still inside the fish. Jonah declares salvation belongs to the Lord while he is still inside the fish. I don't know about you, and I don't think the acoustics were quite as good as the VeggieTales movie made it out to sound like. I don't think it was like reverberating around with a nice bass tone. I think in there, Jonah was experiencing the bleakness of life, and yet he still could see and experience God's presence and declare the truth of who God was. When his life was fainting away, one commentator offers that each of these verses, 7, 8, and 9, ought to have the phrase, salvation belongs to the Lord, uh, right after it. So instead of reading as, as, as one set of words, it would be, when my life was fading away, salvation belongs to the Lord. I remembered the Lord, salvation belongs to the Lord. My prayer came to you, salvation belongs to the Lord. Into your holy temple, salvation belongs to the Lord. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, salvation belongs to the Lord. But with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. Salvation belongs to the Lord. What I vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It is a powerful declaration of Jonah about where he is. At this point, it could be the end of Jonah's story. Still, he would have finished it declaring the truth of who God is, that it is salvation that is found in the Lord not in all Jonah's own actions, Jonah's own thoughts about maybe who deserved to hear the message of the gospel. It is not in Jonah's fear that prompted him to run from the Ninevites, from the command of God, but it is the Lord who deserves the praise. This week I've been pondering a song um, by, the, by Hillsong United. It's called Highlands. These are the words of, of the bridge at the end of the song. It says, I will praise you on the mountain. I will praise you when the mountain's in my way. You're the summit where my feet are, so I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows, no less faithful when the l night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is in the highlands and the heartache all the same. I think this captures beautifully the refrain that Jonah spoke from the fish. 
Salvation belongs to the Lord. When he was the prophet in Israel declaring the word, and when he was in the belly of the fish, it didn't change who God was. It didn't change the reality of the power of the gospel. And the highlands and the heartache, all the same. A consistency of experiencing, of knowing it. Interestingly enough, in the middle of Jonah's declaration, he almost offers a rebuke to others, which is kind of curious. In the middle of it, he starts talking about vain idols and forsaking the hope of steadfast love. It is almost in the midst of it, he goes, oh, there's people who need to hear the message that what they're doing is wayward. What they're doing is not what God would want them to be. Now, the question becomes, who specifically is he referring to? If you read from the context of the story, so far we've seen three different character groups. We've seen the sailors, we've seen Jonah, and then we've seen the Ninevites. He probably could have been talking to the sailors. Um, They were mere innocent bystanders of this story, and yet through knowing Jonah and what they experienced with Jonah, we see them recognizing the power of the Lord. He could be talking about Nineveh, who would worship their own idols and had nothing to do with God, recognizing that because they were so distracted by their worthless idols, they'd missed out on seeing who the true God of the world is. Although it could be somebody outside the story. It could have been Jonah's reflection on Israel as a whole. A larger critique of the nation of Israel at this time, Israel had kind of wandered off. They were approaching the time where the Assyrians were going to come into Israel Israel, we know from the biblical story, and take them captive. Maybe Jonah is recognizing that he himself is part of a larger system that would put things in the way of God, who would put their own desire to worship whatever they wanted ahead of the place of worshiping God for what he is. Our lives can follow that trajectory as well where we put things that aren't necessarily bad in themselves, but we put them up on a pedestal where they become more important or more valuable to us than before. I was talking to my my neighbor yesterday. He wanted to call me over to make sure I knew that he got a hole-in-one on the golf course a few days before. And he made sure sure to clarify that there was a witness, so that was really important. But we're talking about hockey and the return of hockey and how exciting it'll be that there'll be hockey on TV again soon. And part of me is excited that sports is returning and that there will be something to program, but part of me knows that for some it'll be escapism. It'll be of forgetting about the the, the things of life that we ought to be focused on and pouring ourselves into something else to maybe distract us from what is really happening, of maybe wrestling through some of those difficult and challenging parts of life that we are facing together. We can put up idols. For some, it might be sports. Others, it might be music. It might be a whole number of things, and they aren't necessarily sinful, although they become sinful when they take the place of God. For others, it is sinful behaviors that have become the foundation of their life, the thing that drives them, that focuses them, of hiding it, of keeping it from others. Scripture is clear that sin must be removed. Jesus, so strongly speaking of sin, says if your right hand causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better to you lose one of your members than the whole body be thrown into hell. Dealing with sin is a real and true matter. Jesus says it must be done with intensity. Not that we all should be walking around blind. Um, It was a metaphor to a larger picture Jesus was unfolding but a recognition of the importance of not letting it fester and continue, of not letting those idols become the center of who we are, but instead allowing Christ to be there. And that leads into kind of the last part of this this passage as Jonah makes this profound declaration. The picture of Jonah and his experience in the fish resurfaces again in Jesus' own story. See, as Jesus was traveling about doing all of his miracles and signs, there was those who came up to him and asked him a question. Jesus healing people. Um, Jesus doing and teaching in a way that was, was unique and new. Jesus showing the power of God in the midst of them. They come up and say, hey, give us a sign. The Pharisees and scribes said, give us a sign. Jesus rebukes them for looking at a sign and says, no sign will be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jesus validates the experience of Jonah. Some who thought that maybe the story of Jonah was just a work of fiction, was just maybe a dramatic telling of a story that wasn't really as significant as it was. Jesus himself says, no, that story is a picture. A picture of what is coming. See, Jonah, at the point of death, feeling like all hope was lost because of his sin, was pulled from the depth. Jesus, who was sinless, went to the point of of death for humanity. Jesus went to the point of death so that he could redeem those who were sinful. Those like Jonah who had turned from God and fallen. Those like us who are sinless and in need of our Savior. Jesus was coming to do what Jonah couldn't. That was to point people to the true and full way of following God. Jonah tried but Jonah had sin in his life. He couldn't fully comprehend all that God called him to and the redeeming plan of the Lord. But Jesus himself would come. He would experience those three days and three nights in the tomb, just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the fish, so that the world, not just Nineveh, could know the power and the redemption of God. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That we, like Jonah, are drifting. We, like Jonah, have fallen away from the plan God has for us. But we can turn our attention to God and know through the sign that Jesus points to, the sign of the cross, can have redemption. We can be pulled out from the depths, from the sea, from the crashing waves around us, from the brokenness of our world, the brokenness of our hearts, the sadness, the hurt, that through faith in Jesus Christ we can be redeemed, that we can experience the fullness of what God has for us if we lay aside our worthless idols and worship the Lord. If we turn our attention from the things of earth to the things of God and walk in the fullness of the plan that God has for us, we can experience the depth of the love and experience the presence of God that no matter how far we try to run, that God's presence is still there, still awaiting us to turn and repent from our sin and to walk in the fullness of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he has loved us, even when we are dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been sa saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus. We can experience that aliveness in Christ, that hopefulness that no matter what our present situation, the present storm in our life might be, the uncertainty of the future, the uncertainty of life, we can know that God's rich mercy and love for us can be experienced today in fullness if we look towards Christ. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the sign of the fish. Lord, the powerful story of your transformation in Jonah's life, that though he was not deserving of your grace, you extended it to him. That even in the midst of the waters, in the depth of his depravity, of his drifting away, you were still there with him. That your command over the earth, your command over creation sustained him. And though he endured hardship and, and struggle, you allowed the fish to sustain him, and then ultimately for him to go on and be able to carry the message you would have for him. Lord, today we thank you that through the power of the cross, through Jesus' death and resurrection, we too can be made alive. That though we drift, we have drifted, that we can still call upon your name and know that you are with us, that we cannot escape your presence, that you are there waiting, wanting us to look upon you, to seek you in all situations. Lord, I pray that 
we would not turn to you only in times of desperation, but that we would make you the first priority in all that we do. Keeping our eyes fixed on you in each and every circumstance we face. Lord, we know there is much uncertainty. There is much stress that our current pandemic brings. But we know that you are greater and more powerful. That you are still sitting upon your throne. May we draw strength and encouragement from that today. In your name we pray. Amen. As a reminder, we have the Fireside Night at Ed and Edna's tonight at 645. Hope you can make it. As we go now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Christ Jesus our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Go in his grace today.